welcome back to the Citizen Channel. Hope you're all staying safe and well. And uh, yes, another edition of Managing City. And we're going fairly recent. We're going 1998, the 18th of February, approximately. They're never spot on these dates of managers coming and going, but it's around about the 18th of February, 1998. To the 21st of May 2001, another significant date. Um, yeah, not the happiest time, but we're going to have a look at the guy who was in charge in that period. Of course, it's uh, an ex player, uh, there's uh, one or two knocking about who've played and managed Manchester City. And of course, we're going to have a look at Joe Royal today. So please join me as a look, a quick look at Joe Royal's tenure, obviously, the what was going on in those seasons as well as part of this. So please join me. And if you are new to the channel, please push that subscribe button, push the bell notifications. Great to have you on board. City past, present and forever, of course, and uh, all your comments, certainly on this set, uh, Joe Royal. We've, we've touched upon him in other vlogs as well, but we've not done a managing city on him, so there may be slight crossovers of information, but it's always always good to uh, redo stuff, isn't it? But uh, this is fairly, this is fairly uh, not been out there so much. I've not done the, his the history of Manchester City up to 1998, 99, 2000, 2001 yet. We're up, to, we're up to the 70s on that, so obviously a bit further down the line, of course, we'll be touching upon these seasons again in, in my the uh, comprehensive history of Manchester City. But hey, this is Joe Rowe we're looking at today. Right, let's get on with this one. Please, have you pushed that subscribe channel uh, button? Have you pushed that bell notification? Give us a thumbs up as well if you have as well. Just give us a little thumbs up if you uh, make an old City fan very, very happy. Yes, literally on the same day, Frank Clark was given his marching orders. Old big Joe Rowe was taking over his uh, still sort of tepidly warm seat. He'd been sort of out of football for 11 months at the time, Joe, after resigning from Everton in 1997. He'd had a disagreement with the chairman. He'd won the FA Cup with Everton just months after his return, but left as Everton fought for their Premier Division status. Nothing changes for Everton, does it? Uh, done a lot of TV work and also done some scouting for England in the meantime. And Royal's appointment on, on, on or around the 18th of February 1998 was pretty much appreciated by the fans uh, after the... Well, I don't want to be unkind, but after the Frank Clark or the drabness of, of Frank Clark, who did, did find it hard to motivate uh, certainly the fans, if, if not the players. And Royal wanted to be one of those to, to get things right for City, although he would have his doubts throughout his, his short tenure. But uh, he said at the time, why shouldn't it be him who gets it right? Well... Almost, almost, Joe. Well, was seemingly approachable and friendly, unlike some of his predecessors. His CV was fine. As we've already said, he'd won the FA Cup with Everton, as mentioned, and has saved them from relegation. He worked wonders at Oldham, of course, getting them promoted and to a League Cup final and two FA Cup semi-finals. In fact, whilst at Oldham, City had approached him and he'd very nearly come a few years earlier, but he decided at the last minute when he was almost decided to come to City to change his mind. A lot of a lot of that's put down to one fan, wasn't it, who stayed behind at, at Oldham's ground and sort of pleaded with him not to go. In the 11 months he'd been out, he'd turned down apparently 14 approaches to manage after leaving Everton. And on the day he was appointed, we were actually playing Ipswich Town on the same night with the manager's notes in the programme still by a certain Frank Clark. We sat 22nd out of 24. We played 31 and had 30 points. Frank Clark's final player input to the squad was a, a certain Beardsley. Uh, yes, I always still find it hard to, to believe he played and I watched him, to be honest with you, for City. He made his debut, but it wasn't going to be a dream start for Royal as we went down to an injury time winner in a 2-1 loss. Royal wasted no time. Within two weeks, he got his ex-City playing legend, Willie Donaghy from Sheffield United, his number two. Of course, uh, he took little con convincing. He'd been with Joe at Oldham, of course. Uh, little convincing to join Royal and, of course, to join his ex-club, City. Royal would, all Royal would also... Uh, Comment that he'd also worked closer with Stewart and Bernstein, who, uh, when he became chairman, he wasn't quite chairman at this time. Some other guy was in charge. We'll brief mention of him in a moment. Uh, but uh, apparently, he would have that sort of link with uh, Stewart and Bernstein on a more or less daily basis. Royal soon had doubts about a certain fan's favourite. King Cladsey, 
for the fight ahead to keep City at the time in the first division. And perhaps to compensate, and you can't blame him, perhaps Royal got the fan, tried to get the fans, and he certainly succeeded on his side by calling our support phenomenal uh, on the pitch. He also worried about the fitness levels of the team, uh, which weren't great when he'd taken over. But by the end of February, early March, City won two games consecutively for the first time in almost a year at home to West Brom and away at fellow strugglers, strugglers Huddersfield. Field. The two victories raised City to the heady heights of 17th, but it all started to go wrong. Royal, despite being given the odd, giving, giving him the odd game, was still not convinced about Kinky. He's still not there. And most fans began, began to accept that Royal was probably correct. Royal had many players to pick from, but he had to get rid of some to reduce the wage bill. And players like David Morley, Ray Ingram, Eddie McGoldrick were all on the way out. And even Kink had been allowed to fly to Ajax for talks with them. Players came in, of course. Uh, we still managed to wheel and deal. Jamie Pollock came in for a million four hundred thousand for a guy called Sean Golter. Wonder what happened to him. Ian Bishop on a free from West Ham, which was always going to please the City fans. A big favourite, of course. Lee finally, Francis Lee finally went as chairman and was replaced officially by Bernstein. And Royal said said he classed Lee though as a friend, not just a colleague. There was a brief respite for Royals and the team with a 4-1 home win against Stockport County on April the 4th. Much to the relief of us. Uh, yes, another embarrassment at the hands of that lot was uh, perhaps too, was totally unacceptable. But City, uh, we sat 21st on 43 points. And after this game, just one place above the relegation zone. The same points, ironically, as ex-manager Alan Ball's Portsmouth. With two games left, sadly, though, 21st found survival. We found survival not in our own hands. Royal brought Kinky back for his fourth game under him for the last home game against QPR. Royal has said City had been unlucky to glean only one point over the Easter period, but it had done serious damage, or almost terminal damage to us. Despite Kinky scoring within a minute, City defender, we all we all know it, we've all seen it, we all remember it. City defender Jamie Pollock put QPR ahead after a Mike Sharon equaliser by heading calmly over Margerson rather than back to him and into his own goal. Bradbury did get a rare goal and equaliser, but sadly a winner wouldn't come. And most of the 32,000, of which I was there with my lad, most of the 32,040 crowd, crowd stayed for a lap of honour at the end in true loyal City supporter fashion. So City had to beat Stoke at their place and hope, and it was a vain hope, I hate that we have to wait wait for other people to do things, hope Port Vale or Alan Ball's Ports would, would fail to win their away games. Sadly, despite a feisty game and a feisty game on and off the pitch, a 5-2 win over Stoke, uh, over the other team's triumphs as well. So it didn't mean anything, and we that Royal had failed in his quest to save City from relegation. Despite this, most thought he'd been given an unenviable task. He probably had. So he still had a lot of credit in the bank with City fans, who, despite the catastrophe, more than ever appeared to want to get behind the team. As expected, seemingly just as Royal had always wanted, Kinky moved on. No rigours of the third tier of English football for him. And sadly, long-serving Ian Brightwell also left that season. And on to the 98-99 season, which would end in glory, of course. The fans did actually look forward to this, and I as a fan certainly did. Uh, we, You know, it's, it's all this old gallows humour, isn't it? When we're down, we stick together. And there was plenty to look forward to in that 98-99 season. Royal had cut the squad by about 20, I think, at that stage. And still had plenty of plenty of players to go at to carry on. A new kipper, new kipper, new capper, high vis kit sold out very quickly and Capper had missed a little trick there with uh, not, not producing enough of them. Royal had many players who didn't feature in his plans. About 30, I think it was still about 30 left that he wanted to get rid of. But getting a club to take them was, was definitely a problem, especially for acceptable wages. But slowly and surely, he started to get rid. Only Tiato came in initially as he needed, according to Royal, cover on the left side defensively and into midfield. He had also brought in a new fitness coach and was now far happier with his stamina levels for a long, tough season. Royal's starting lineup for the first game against Blackpool was Weaver, Edgehill, Horlock, Tchadzki, Tchadzki, remember him? Well, Royal had told him he was surplus to requirements, but he knuckled down, worked hard, and Royal had been impressed. He only lasted to league game two away at Fulham when he did his cruciate and unfortunately never played again for us. 
Vikings, Vaughan, Mason, Pollock, Golter, Dickoff, Bradbury. Like like the City fans, uh, Royal was pretty pleased with a 3 0 win, though it could have been many more. Yeah, it could have been a half, could have been six, seven, eight, who knows? Things look promising. And Royal was happy as a League Cup second leg at Main Road versus Knox County, ended in another uh, thrashing, a 7 1 win for us. But in the league, yeah, okay, it started, we started to stutter immediately. Two further draws and a loss after four games, and we sat, yeah. 14th, 14th in the third tier of English football. Royal was convinced that Sean Golter was the man, despite not the greatest start last season and so far this, uh, to, to lead us to glory. The fans as yet hadn't seen the best of a man, of course, who's become a legend for many of us. Royal also appeared to be trying to get cards and sending offs looked at. He wasn't happy with their discipline. City did have disciplinary problems at the time. We had people like Tony Vaughan picking up yellow cards, etc. Kevin Horlock, Jamie Pollock being the main culprits. He was always trying to stick up for the players who he judged the refs had been too harsh on. Yes, he was always sticking up for them and uh, and slagging the refs off in, in in a reasonable way. He would also then have Andy Morrison to add to the mix and defend as well in future future games. Bradbury and Brennan left and Royal brought in Michael Branch but more importantly the aforementioned Andy Morrison. Royal considers his leadership would ensure City's transformation. He wouldn't be far wrong certainly in the longer term but the fans are restless. Royal oversaw City playing a rare first round match of the AXA FA Cup in a 3-0 win. Yes I was there at that one. You have to be, you have to be at these things because you don't know when you know the, the sort of um, never done it before in, in a, my, you know ever uh, in, in the modern day football, it's always the third round, and of course, a 3 0 home win against Halifax. And from of only 11,000 of us, though, 11,106, that includes nearly 2,000 Halifax fans. So, I don't know where we all were, but uh, we weren't at the cup games, that's for sure. In the second round, we traveled to Darlington. We earned a replay, but Donicky came out, the assistant, Joel Royal's assistant, and he was unhappy with the negativity from the fans there. And over just 1,267, I think, diehard fans. There's probably some in the home ends as well. Uh, abuse was hurled at players and management. Were you there that day? I wasn't. Let me know. At least we made it to round three draw. Uh, when we won the replay 1-0 in front of, yeah, another low crowd at May Road, 8,500 crowd with over 1,100 Darlow fans as well. Hey, I was there in that one as well. Oh, well, that's as far as we got. We got dumped out in the third round at Wimbledon. Despite OK crowds in the league, as I said, uh, not great in the cup there. Over 28,000 we were averaging this season. Would, would, uh, we would have our worst ever for a competitive game. Another one where I've done a vlog on it in the auto windscreen shield game against Mansfield, which attracted just 3,007 to main row. 658 Mansfield fans. So me and my lad were in that little crowd. Check out my little vlog on that one. Royal brought in Gareth Taylor to inspire us, the high-vis blues. By mid-December, Joe Royal said Main Road has become a monument to frustration. To change, we had to start winning matches. The fans' loyalty was being severely tested and Royal, usually supportive of the fans, wrote in programme notes at the end of 1998. There is a certain element who are becoming very vociferous and very negative. And listening to them, I can understand why two chairmen and a succession of managers have been hounded out of the place. He called for patience. Didn't go down particularly well at the time, I remember. By Boxing Day, a trip to Wrexham, which we went on to win. Royal knew we had to do better as we had laid 12th and remained outwardly confident that he could turn it all around. We weren't so sure. But, and yes, starting with that 28th of December win over Stoke City, we would go on a 12-game unbeaten run, winning seven. The Stoke game was seen by many, and I think at the time, I remember it keenly, uh, as a turnaround in City's fortunes as a team and crowd played off each other to great effect. Yeah, I mean, tackles were flying in, the, the fans were up for it, the kipax was roaring. It was great stuff. Terry Cook was added from United in mid-January and he compared the City fans favourably with that lot across the road. As you'd expect, that went down well with us. Royal began to think the P word, promotion, as, as, as us, we did. After a mishmash of a start, once again, Royal was back to praising the City fans in his programme notes. He, know, he knows where his bread's buttered. During the 12-match run, there was a nil-nil at Bournemouth where City finished the game with nine men. Pollock was sent off. 
And then famously, so was Horlock for walking aggressively towards the referee. Mr. Royal was not happy. By February the 20th, the 2 0 win over mighty Macclesfield. City sat fifth. Fulham were nailed on champions, but everything else was up for grabs. Work Royal will continue to question the quality of the referees as City appeared to have men sent off on a regular basis. They were not good at this level, but then again, nothing changes, does it? A home defeat by Oldham, no less, ended our 12 game unbeaten run in mid March, but City went on to win seven and draw one of the next eight very impressive the draw was a 1-1 at Preston where again Royal was unhappy with the referee and got stick from the press as well who claimed he refused to talk to them after the game Royal simply said the team were running late and Royal had no time to go to the other side of the ground to have a chat but with three games left we lost to Wickham and drew with Bristol Rovers and automatic promotion had gone we took third place with a sellout main road victory 4-0 against York City a two-legged victory against Wigan set off set up a playoff final versus Gillingham at Wembley. That classic win at Wembley followed and Royal said, we're not getting too excited about this as a club this size. This club this size should not be too euphoric about getting out of the old Division 3. Royal was firm in refusing the offer of a homecoming parade. He was well tuned in to most City fans who I think definitely agreed, but we loved our Wembley playoff win. Of course we did. We've touched upon, I've touched upon it in many vlogs but there was no irony in our chance at Wembley that day when we were proudly sung you can stick your effing treble up your ass, aimed at the United fans, of course, who had completed a treble, I think, at the time. And we actually meant it. We didn't. We were. It wasn't ironic. Uh, we just really meant it. Well, there you go. So, in part two, please. That was the end of part one. I hope you enjoyed that. Looking at Joe Royal's tenure. In part two, more celebration, of course, but also relegation as we look at Royal's last two seasons at the helm at Main Road. Thanks for joining me. Let me know your memories. Let me know your comments. It'd be great to hear from. Until the next time, and that's one thing, don't I? Please stay safe, please. Come on, City. Bye for now.